well, thank you everyone for coming. This is the second module of Science Policy and Advocacy for STEM Scientists Certificate Program. We are really excited to have uh, uh, really uh, an expert panel and speakers who are going to give us more like a bird's eye view and then we'll get into finer details of um, this policy research specific policy. The focus of this module is to make you aware that policy is nothing alien. We want to make sure that whatever you are doing right now, whatever research you are involved in, that same research can be used for policy. And we'll give you training on that, but this would be a good experience, uh, sort of learning part in that. We'll also hear a little bit about how early care researchers, based on the research you're doing, can involve into uh, the policy arena. That's something which we'll, you'll see that it's going to keep emerging on almost every module. Um, Kay is consultant and science policy, and he's also a governing board member of Journal of Science Policy and Governance. Then we have Professor Steve Allison from University of California, Irvine. Then we have a great panel of uh, early career researchers who are involved either still working towards policy or they are pol doing policy full time. And you'll get to hear about how as ECR at this point you can get involved and in how many different things exist. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Kay Koizumi. Um, Kay was most recently a senior advisor in science policy at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS. He also worked to establish the AAAS Center for Science, Scientific Evidence and Public Issues, which you may be familiar with. Prior to AAAS, he was an assistant director for federal research and development and senior advisor at the National Science and Technology Council, NSTC, at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. While at OSTP, he was responsible for leading engagement on the US federal R&D budgets, appropriations, as well as policies and for science and technology policy coordination through the NSTC. Before joining OSDP, he served as the Director of R&D Budget and Policy Programs at AAAS. He's also a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, as well as a Governing Board Member for the Journal of Science Policy and Governance. Today, Kay will provide a broad overview of how early career researchers can utilize their research skills towards implementing evidence-based policy. Kay. Hi. Uh, good to be talking to you today. So I'm Kay Koizumi, and I think of myself as a science policy practitioner. And I've been doing science policy mostly in Washington, DC for about 25 years. Um, as a little bit of background, I think of myself as a social scientist uh, grounded in economics. And my core expertise is government funding of science and engineering research, especially US federal government. I'm also a science policy teacher at George Washington University. So as you heard, I've spent most of my career at AAAS and also uh, in the Obama White House in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And I, I said that I think of myself as a science policy practitioner because um, I work for science policy makers. I don't think of myself as actually making policy, but I do contribute to uh, making policy. And of course, so can you. And to me, Practicing science policy means putting science into action, not only in policy for science, but also science for policy. How do I do that? I try to help people build things, whether it is building science policy legislation, science initiatives, science budgets, or healthcare legislation, national security legislation, legislation and policies that may not have on the surface anything to do with science. I also try to help build things like a new center at AAAS, new working groups within the federal government, all to try to connect scientists to other decision makers. So my central question that I hope to answer for you today is, how can you as an early career researcher utilize your research skills for advancing evidence-based policy? So my short answer is by bringing your evidence to policymakers and practitioners. So three suggestions. Number one, write. Write policy memos, blog posts, op-eds, policy analyses, tech assessments, white papers, and other science documents, and get decision makers to read them. Fortunately, you have the opportunity to learn how during this course. And you have lots of examples. Look at the journal 
of science policy and governance, for example, JSPG. Now, one tip that I have is start with your research if you can. It's great practice for explaining your field of science to non-scientific audiences. And it's even better practice for doing what science policy professionals do, which is explaining other people's research to policymakers. Because over time, if you stick with science policy, it's unlikely you'll be working on a policy issue that's an exact match with your research. If you're an economist like me, you may start out thinking explaining you know, government research funding, but you may be called on to explain the Higgs boson discovery or what 350 parts per million CO2 means. So start now to be ready. And to make it all worth it, of course, you can publish your work in GSPG to give it a wide audience. I say all this because policy memos, et cetera, really are the way we communicate science to policymakers, especially in Washington, DC. You know, when I worked at the White House, we had stacks and stacks of them explaining everything from deep water oil drilling to Zika to colony collapse disorder to sea level rise to, well, you name it. So when I served on the selection committees for the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowships, we had candidates write up policy memo because, as we told them, once you get selected, you're going to be writing more of them for your bosses. They're not going to read research papers, do the research, read national academies meetings reports, or talk to the experts in your field. You are, and you're going to give it to them in two pages. These short written documents are really the way evidence gets communicated, especially in Washington, DC. We need you to bring your evidence, your science, your research to the attention of policymakers, making decisions in every conceivable topic outside science. Second, do policy pitches. Fortunately, you're learning how. They work. It takes practice and skill to communicate scientific evidence in person to a decision maker. As with written memos, start with your research. Can you explain your research to me? And can you help me understand why your research is relevant to a public policy challenge? Whether it's improving healthcare or helping us manage climate change or whatever. If you can, great. Then you can use your research skills and communication skills to branch out to policy pitches outside your field. You'll find out that to make the most effective pitch, you have to know your audience. You will say different things to a PhD scientist in another field than you would a lawyer or a county commission. So when you feel confident, you can try it out. You're going to require tools and ideas in this class. You know, pitch your state representative on how scientific evidence can help solve a problem in your state. Pitch your member of Congress. I will tell you again, in the White House, we had everyone from Nobel Prize winning scientists to undergraduate science majors talking to both us, the science staff, and non-science staff, including budget people, security people, environmental policy people, et cetera. Uh, and we had them talk to them, uh, talk to us about their science and how their evidence could help solve problems. 10 minutes each, maybe, maybe 30 minutes if you just won the Nobel Prize. You know, at AAAS, we brought our members to Washington, D.C. to have just such conversations. And we gave them what you're getting, a crash course in how to talk science to policy audiences, but also to other science audiences. One of the questions we asked, you know, SNT policy fellow candidates was, you're sitting next to the president's science advisor on the Washington Metro, and you have three stops or five minutes to tell him about your science. What would you say? That's an elevator pitch. It's a Metro pitch, uh, because it's true. You know, my boss, John Holdren, President Obama, science advisor, took Metro to the White House, and he did get pitches about their science issue. So three. When it comes to science funding, you make it personal. Uh, I'm switching gears here from uh, science for policy to policy for science, because we're also talking about advocating for research funding today. You know, I want to address research advocacy. Uh, that, here, the evidence you want to bring to decision makers is you. When it comes to how much the federal government should invest in NSF next year or NIH or DOE, 
decision makers in Washington, D.C. have a lot of the data because that's my job to give them charts, graphs, tables on the NSF budget, where the money goes, what kind of research it funds. So I and my colleagues in Washington, D.C. can give them that evidence, but I can't tell your story. So it's up to you to tell policymakers about your research. And when you're advocating for science funding, why federal funding for research is important. You know, if your education and your research are made possible by an NSF fellowship, an NIH training grant, or your advisor being able to support you because of a NASA research grant, or you're working in a DOD-funded research center, let everyone know. Tell me, tell everyone. I've met a lot of policymakers in Washington, D.C. who support NSF and NIH because of the big picture of economic competitiveness and faster cures. But many of them don't know that so much of that research is being done in their home states by their constituents, including you. Knowing that would make their support stronger. So every year in the Obama administration, President Obama invited that year's Nobel Prize winners to the White House to meet with them on their way to Stockholm. So one of them asked me, what should I say to the president? You know, far, far be for me to tell a Nobel Prize winner what to say to the president, but I said, I would really appreciate it if you could tell them that the work you're being honored for was supported by NSF and that it's important for the US to keep supporting NSF and other science agencies. I think he followed my advice, I don't know. So I say the same thing to you that I say to Nobelists. Tell policymakers about your science and the federal programs that support your research and your education. Help them see the connection between science funding and you. So let me sum up. Here's how you can use your research skills to advance evidence-based policy. Start by bringing your evidence and your research to policy to, number one, write great policy memos or other documents. Number two, do policy pitches and practice them. And number three, advocating for science funding by telling the story of science funding and you. So I hope that gives you an introduction to, into many of the important things you'll be learning, and I'm happy to be part of the conversation. Good luck. Thank you very much for that. Uh, that was a great introduction, and thank you for mentioning pitches and memos. We'll be doing all these things, hopefully, to give you practice throughout the course. Uh, are there any questions for Kay? I'm looking at the q and a Feel free to type your questions in chat and yeah. we'll make sure that these get asked. Uh, Adriana, this one question, you wanna go ahead, take that? Yes, question from Nimi, Va from Nimi Vashi. How often are these pitches heard? Is there a session uh, for online where they will be submitted? So we will have, um, are you asking for during the course or more broadly? The ones they mentioned that I meant, well, I mean, well, the thing about pitches, of course, is that they kind of live in the real world. And I guess some people are now recording them on YouTube or something or things like that. Um, but I don't know. This is like in real life. Um, so we have another question about the AAAS program. This is something we've encountered before as far as whether anyone can apply, whether it's open to um, individuals who are not U.S. citizens. Do you have any uh, recommendations for applying? Uh -huh. Oh, for me? Uh, well, the AAAS program is one of several programs that offer you know, opportunities for scientists engineers to work in a policy office. The AAAS one is one that is open only to US citizens if you have a PhD, um, and it's for you know, federal government agencies in Washington, DC and congressional offices. But there, I hope you have a chance to experience many other types of opportunities, whether it's working at the National Academies of Science or uh, working uh, as a, doing a fellowship in a scientific society in Washington, D.C., or a fellowship in a state legislature in your state. Um, so uh, there are lots of these opportunities. Um, 
And yeah, and now I'm seeing some of these other questions. Did I answer that question well? I yeah, I think that's really helpful. So just to um, add on to that, we will be we will have a module on STPF as well as other fellowships you can go uh, apply for. Some of them are open to non-US citizens, so we can discuss that when we get to that point, as well as local engagements. So there's a question about town halls. Yeah. Um, we'll have a um, module on local engagement and policy. I don't know if you have comments on that um, aspect. I like this question here about how do you approach policymakers who have conflicts between paths that seem to be best supported by science and paths that are most popular amongst the voters' funders? Mm. Uh, that is the eternal question. Because you know, one thing that you know, I find useful to remember is that po policymakers and politicians have lots of things that they have to consider. Evidence is just one of the things they consider. They consider scientific evidence, economic evidence, but they also consider, of course, the views of their constituents, the views of their funders. So, you know, a little bit of empathy that politicians have to weigh all of these things. And science is never going to be the only thing that makes a decision. Uh, the best you can do, the best we can do, is to make sure that they have the information and evidence from science that they need to make an informed decision. Um, and the rest is out of our control. Uh, we have another question about what are some effective methods for getting in-person meetings with policymakers? Well, um, normally I would say you can find them everywhere because it's an election year, but you know, this is an you know, unusual time, right? Um, so, you know, what I've seen, policymakers, if they're, especially if they're your member of Congress or your state representative, they want your vote. So they want to hear from you. And, you know, if you're at a campaign event, a 4th of July parade, Labor Day parade, town hall meeting virtual, then you have a chance. You have a chance to maybe say two minutes about, you know, why, what's important to you. And if you can make that conversation about what's important to you, about your science, then you are having a science policy conversation, a you know, science policy pitch. So look for those, those opportunities. Further on, I hope next year that we'll be having other opportunities like Congressional Visits Day, in which you know, students and professionals in STEM uh, have the chance through the sponsorship of your science and engineering societies to come to Washington, D.C to advocate on behalf of science to members of Congress and to federal agencies. I hope when that's possible that you'll take advantage of that opportunity. Great, that's really helpful, thank you. So just in the interest of time, let's move on to the panel and then we can come back to these uh, later. Thank